Today is set to be a suspenseful one at Hong Kong Convention and Exhibition Center as we welcome police officer turned best selling author Claire McIntosh, who will be、uh, joining us later. 大家好，再一次咧欢迎大家嚟到书展嘅现场，参加由 Book Depository 赞助嘅第二场阅读分享会。大家咧有冇觉得今日咧我哋呢一个嘅会展咧充满悬疑嘅感觉咧？因为咧其实我哋邀请咗咧曾经担任警察，摇身一变咧成为全球最佳销量嘅作家 Claire McIntosh 咧嚟到我哋嘅今日嘅分享会咧，同大家去做一啲分享嘅。If it's your first time tuning in, please allow me to introduce myself. My name is Patricia from Hong Kong.、Uh, it's an absolute honor for me to be here today, and I'd like to extend a heartfelt thanks to Book Depository for sponsoring our event, and of course, the Hong Kong Book Fair for making this all possible. 咁相信咧有啲观众朋友咧系第一次咧参与我哋嘅阅读分享会嘅，等我都自我介绍一下先。我系嚟自香港嘅 Patricia。咁今日咧都好开心可以同大家咧主持呢一个嘅分享会。咁我好亦都喺度咧想借呢个。机会多谢 Book Depository 赞助我哋今日嘅活动，当然啦，仲有香港书展咧去支持我哋，令到我哋咧可以有一个咁特别嘅活动噶。As most of us here today are book lovers, I think this company should need no introduction. If those of you who will need a refresher, Book Depository is a leading international book retailer with over 20 million books available and free delivery worldwide. Their vision is to provide all books to all by improving the selection, accessibility, and affordability of books. 咁由於咧，我哋呢度大部分嘅朋友咧，我相信都係閱讀愛好者嚟噶啦，唔使多講咧，我諗大家都認識 Book Depository 咧，係一間國際領先嘅網上零售書店，擁有超過二千萬本嘅書籍，仲提供咧全球免運費優惠。咁佢哋希望咧，透過佢哋嘅平台啦，去增加書目嘅選擇，令到每個人咧都可以輕易揾到價格咧優惠嘅深水書籍。So before we begin, I'd like to share a piece of good news with all of you that everyone joining us here in the room at the Hong Kong Convention and Exhibition Center will receive an exclusive 20% discount voucher in the full catalog from all invited authors this year. You can take the flyer you found on your seats to Book Depository's booth in Hall One C A16 for redemption. 咁活动开始之前咧，头先可能都听到噶啦，同大家分享咗一个好消息，就系咧各位喺现场参与嘅朋友咧，将会获得 Book。Depository 独家嘅优惠券，可以咧用八折嘅优惠价钱咧购买今次出席分享会嘅三位知名作家嘅任何作品嘅。咁大家咧只需要拎住你哋单位诶座位上面嘅单张啦，去到展览厅一 C A 十六 Book Depository 嘅摊位咧就可以使用到噶啦。So I know you may have a lot of questions to ask our author today. If you do have one in mind, and you may want to post your questions and have our author answer for you, do scan the QR code that has been put up、um, around our、uh, event space here for our on-site audience. And for those of you joining us online, you can always type your questions in the live chat box. 咁我相信咧，好多朋友有機會咧，都會有啲提問咧，想向我哋一陣嘅作家去發問嘅。咁如果現場嘅朋友咧，可以 scan 下你哋喺會場入面見到嘅 QR code， 就可以咧將你哋嘅問題擺上去。咁我哋一陣間咧都會去挑選一啲問題去揾我哋嘅作家啦，為你哋解答嘅。咁而喺我哋網上參加嘅朋友咧，就可以喺我哋嘅 comment box 嗰度咧打低你哋嘅問題，咁我哋咧都會收得到噶。So here today we are at the second presentation in our Book Depository's seminar series, which features best-selling writers from across the world. Claire McIntosh will be speaking to us in this session on her path from crime fighter to crime writer. Claire is the multi-award-winning author of five best-selling novels, including I See You, I Let You Go, Let Me Lie, and After the End. Her novels have been translated into more than forty languages, and her books have sold in excess of two million copies worldwide. Have been New York Times, USA Today, and international bestsellers, and have spent a combined total of sixty-four weeks in the Sunday Times bestseller chart. Her latest thriller, Hostage, a locked room thriller set on a twenty-hour flight, was released last year and has become yet another bestseller. She's indeed proved that we can all change our day jobs and follow our dreams. Now, I'd like to do a little warm-up quiz before we introduce and invite Claire to discuss with us what inspires and motivates her work.、Um, now, to interact with our audience here on site and also online, you can scan the QR code shown on screen to enter the quiz. 
and we'll be looking at the results together shortly. Let's show the QR code on screen so that our on-site audience can join in the quiz with us. All right, and for our online audience, you can also answer the question. All right, let's take a look at the question. The question is, Claire's novel, Hostage, takes place upon a flight from London to which city? Okay, option A is Toronto, option B is New York City, and option C is Sydney. All right, I see many of you are inputting your answers already, and we'll be able to look at the correct answer later and see, well, well, hmm, well, the result keeps changing, and most of you for now picked New York City, option B. Okay, a few, uh, followed by option C, Sydney. And some of you picked option A, Toronto. Wow. Maybe I think you secretly want to visit New York City. That's why most of you picked this option, right? Okay, shall we see what is indeed the correct answer from our guest today? Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Clara McIntosh. Hi. Hello, Clara. Welcome to Hong Kong Book Fair. We're very delighted to have you with us today. Thank you so much. It's, uh, I was going to say it's so great to be there. I wish I was there. It would be so nice to be able to meet everyone and talk to you, but this is the next best thing. Right. I know. I want to let you know that we have a lot of fans here joining us today, physically in Hong Kong, as well as online audience joining from all over the world. Do you want to say hello and do you want to say something to our online audience as well? Just thank you so much for tuning in. I, you know, over the last couple of years, I've done so many of these online events, you know, it's almost taken over from live events. And although it's a shame not to be able to meet in person, it's so amazing to know that people are tuning in from all over the world. So welcome and thank you for coming. Right, the beauty of technology, right? So speaking of Hong Kong, I recall you mentioning Hong Kong in your novel After the End. Uh, we're curious to know if this was inspired by any real visits to our city. No, I wish it was. I would so love to come. And I was due to come to your amazing book fair three years ago, I think, or maybe two years. And mm -hmm. as you know, as we all know, things, uh, things got a bit, um, I went a bit wrong. So I wasn't able to, but hopefully one day I will visit. Yeah, I'm sure we're going to welcome you in Hong Kong physically one day. Uh, we actually just did a little quiz with our audience and we would like to have you review the answer for us, okay? So would you like to look at the results with us? Well, actually, same amount of our audience picked New York City and Sydney. What is actually the correct answer? Interesting. So do you know what? Out of those three cities, I've been to two of them mm -hmm. and the other one is the correct answer. So I've been to New York. And I've been to Toronto, but I haven't been to Sydney. And Sydney is the destination of my plane in hostage. Mm, okay, so Sydney is the correct answer. For those of you who didn't pick it right, and even the, the ones that you pick, uh, pick it correctly, do uh, read the novel and you'll find out more in this interesting story. So before I uh, let you begin with your sharing, uh, Claire, I would like to give a warm reminder to our audience. If you'd like to keep yourself on your toes with Claire's other novels, they are all available to purchase on Book Depository. And now let's hand the floor to Claire who will share with us her electrifying career change from an operations inspector for Ossershire in the UK to a best-selling crime author. Over to you, Claire. Thank you. Thank you so much. So what I want to talk about is, um, so a little bit about my, my career, about how I moved from being a police officer to being a crime writer, but also about what I learned from that and how being a police officer made me the writer that I am now. And a lot of this, I think, will apply to other careers as well. So I am... Um, I have always been a, a writer in that I've always loved writing. Um, I, I think writers come through lots of different paths. Uh, I firmly believe that anyone could become a, a writer if they're sort of nurtured in the right way. Um, so when I grew up, I read constantly. I was one of those children who would go to the library, take a stack of books, you know, eight, 10 books, 
go home and two days later I was back at the library wanting more books so I just ate up books I would uh, have my torch under the covers at night desperate to finish the the chapter um so this is very much uh, I suppose how I grew up I grew up in a house of books and reading was one of my favorite pastimes and I look at my kids now and think about how um they loved reading when they were really little and they loved writing stories and now they're teenagers and they've kind of you know the the mobile phones are really exciting and they've got a social life and as a parent I worry about that because I want my kids to be reading all the time but then I think back to what happened when I was a teenager and my love of books kind of tailed off a little bit because suddenly I had a driving license and I could go out with my friends. Um, when I went to university, I was reading lots of academic books um, and actually my love of fiction, which I'd always had as a, as a child, really tailed off a bit. And I know that as a voracious reader, it came back and, um, you know, I now read 100, 150 books a year. So I'm keeping the faith. So if any of you are parents worrying that your children aren't reading, don't worry. It's all is not lost. I think it's a, a process that a lot of teenagers go through. Um, and why am I talking about books when I should be talking about writing? Because I don't think you can be a writer if you're not first and foremost a reader. So reading is how we learn how stories are made um, and how they're told. It's how we learn about character and tension. It's how we step into other worlds. And so it's how we learn how to create them. The books that I loved at the uh, as a child are not dissimilar to the books that I love now. So I read lots of Enid Blyton books, lots of famous five books, which are all about mysteries being solved by amateur detectives, by kids, but they're amateur detectives. They're, they're essentially crime stories and crime novels are what I love to read. Crime novels and thrillers, psychological suspense. So I moved my childhood reading from those, those kids books, those Enid Blyton books, to Agatha Christie and worked my way through Agatha Christie novels and, um, and then sort of progressed to slightly more hard hitting crime novels round about the time that I joined the police and we'll come on to that very shortly. So was I ever taught how to write? Now I wrote stories in the same way that we always do as kids and I had the same sort of um, input, I suppose, that lots of us had in school, that you need your story to have a, a good beginning and a, a middle and an end. And, you know, that advice doesn't change. We'll, we'll talk a bit later on about um, how I came to, to write a novel, but that advice is, is absolutely sound. And so I wrote little stories, I wrote for myself, uh, but I've never had any creative writing training. So my degree was uh, in French and I studied some French literature so I have a, a little bit of a, an insight I suppose into analyzing uh, metaphors and structure of, of a novel as a reader of it but not as a writer and I know that there are lots and lots of creative writing courses out there you can go and do a degree or an MA you can do intensive novel writing courses and they're all brilliant but they shouldn't be a barrier if you feel you can't do them so if you're sitting here thinking well, I really want to be a writer but I I've had no training and I can't afford to have training or I can't access it because I've got young kids or I can't travel or whatever don't let that be a barrier so after university I joined the police um, and it's perhaps an unusual career for a writer to have been in the police first and what I'm going to tell you about is why it's actually the perfect background for uh, being a writer and not just a crime writer. So the obvious reason for a crime writer in particular is that 10 years, 12 years in the police gives you inspiration. So I think a lot of people perhaps think, oh, you must write about your real life cases. And actually, I don't really, because actually the truth of it is that real life crimes 
they're a bit boring because <laughs> criminals in general, you know, you get some criminals who are really clever, of course, but in general, criminals are quite stupid. Um, you know, that's why so many of them get caught. And if we wrote crime novels about slightly stupid uh, or very stupid criminals, then it wouldn't be very exciting. You also find with real life crimes that some of them uh, are solved very, very quickly, far too quickly for a crime novel. It wouldn't be exciting, wouldn't be enough tension and others are never solved. And of course, one of the unwritten rules about crime fiction is that you have to have a resolution. You have got to know who the baddie is even if you decide as the writer that you're not going to lock up that baddie you're going to let them get away with it the reader has to know who did it and why and we don't always know that in the police we perhaps we know who did it but we don't know why um, or perhaps the reason isn't particularly satisfying and again that doesn't work for crime fiction so it it did provide me with inspiration and in fact my very first novel was inspired by a hit and run that happened in um, the town where I was a, a very new police officer. And what that gave me was just the catalyst for a story. I've never written a crime novel that's about a case that I dealt with. Um, the other thing about real life cases is sometimes they are too unbelievable to work in a book. And I'm gonna give you an example because um, this is a, a, an incredible kidnap story that I was involved in and I um, I know that if I ever put it in a book, people would say it was too unbelievable. I don't think my editor would let me do it. So this is what happened. A taxi driver came home from work on New Year's Eve, well, the early hours of New Year's Day, went into his house where there were some men waiting for him and they kidnapped him, put him in the back of his own taxi and drove him hundreds of miles away to a different city where they imprisoned him in a flat. He was kept there for several days and uh, he, there was no way of escaping. During the course of the few days that he was there, he found an old bill with um, the uh, address of the flat. So he knew where he was being kept. Um, he heard them talking to say that they were going to kill him. So time was really running out. And um, they then put him it back in the back of the car and said, we're, we're going to take you now and uh, kill you and, and dump you, um, dump your body. So this was his last chance to escape. So what he did was he wrote the address of uh, the flat. I just realized I've got the story wrong. This is terrible. They took him out. They took him out and then were bringing him back to the flat. This is the story before they were gonna kill him. So he then wrote the address of the flat on a 10 pound note. And he told his kidnappers um, he was gonna be sick and they opened the window for him and he threw this 10 pound note out of the window with the address of the flat. So this, this is what we've now got is uh, a kidnapped man. He's been taken, can't remember what they were doing him, with him now, took him back to the flat. He's, he's still being held hostage. We've got this 10 pound note with the address lying in the gutter in the road. And you'd think that that would just go down a drain or someone would see it and ignore it or they'd see the address and just, you know, and, and the message of help and just think that someone was messing around. But what actually happened was a homeless person found it handed it to a shopkeeper wanting to buy something with it. The shopkeeper saw the message, called the police, and the guy was rescued. So an incredible story, very, very lucky. I couldn't use that in a novel. So there we go. Uh, sometimes you get inspiration for stories from real life, but other times it just won't work for you. The other thing that police did for me, and I think this is really important, is it enabled me to meet people from all walks of life. Now, I grew up in a very uh, white area, a very middle class area, a very safe, comfortable environment. And if I hadn't have worked for all those years in the police, I wouldn't have ever really had that exposure to 
different types of people. So people from aristocracy, for example, people who um, travel around um, in caravans, uh, people who uh, live in flats or big houses or um, live in tents in, in the wood, all sorts of people. And I had, as, as a police officer, I had to learn how to communicate with these people and build a rapport and understand what their lives were like and how that impacted on their situations, the choices that were made for them, the control they had over their lives. And that's really important because as a writer, what you're doing is you're empathizing, you're stepping into someone else's shoes so that the reader can also step into those shoes. And it's really important that writers are able to write authentically about these situations. And so that's what being in the police did for me. Finding the right words. Um, as a police officer, you do a lot of writing. And one of the most important things you can do is to take a, a statement from a victim of crime. Um, and so if something terrible has happened, that victim is trusting you with that story and you're going to write it for them. And a victim who's just been through a terrible experience doesn't give you a beginning, a middle and an end. They don't tell the story in a coherent way. They generally start at the end. Perhaps they've been attacked or they've had something stolen. And then you have to take them back to the beginning. Well, how did this happen? How do you know that person? What was your relationship like before? What were you doing before the attack? You've got to guide them through the story. And then you've got to select exactly the right words to tell that story in a really, really, compelling way so that a court or a judge and jury can understand exactly what's happened to to this victim and so that was a really good training ground for me in making sure that I chose the right voice for the person whose statement I was writing obviously police officers deal with all sorts of different people and one of the types of people we deal with uh, a lot are liars. So I have, set, I have sat in numerous interview rooms talking to crime suspects and I found it fascinating to see how they behave in a pressurized environment, how they lie, what uh, excuses and justification they come up with, how they twist themselves into knots, or perhaps how they are super calm and collected and chilled, even when they have committed a really terrible crime. And this is really useful to me now because the sort of crime novels I write are often psychological thrillers. I'm really looking under the car bonnet. I'm looking at how this person thinks and why they do what they do. The areas that I'm really interested in as a writer are those blurred lines, the gray areas, not black, not white, something in between. Uh, and I'm really, really interested in how easily it is to cross over from a very safe, comfortable life to an unsafe, uncomfortable life, or, to or how easy it is for someone to stop being a law-abiding citizen and become someone who has broken the law, either by choice or by circumstance. When I was a very, very new police officer, so I just joined the police, I was 21, and I met a young, girl my age who was living on the streets. She was a, a heroin addict. And over the course of a number of weeks, we got to know each other, got chatting. Um, her situation meant that she was fairly regularly in trouble for things like shoplifting and drug possession. Um, and we would have conversations. And I, um, I learned that not only were we exactly the same age, but we'd actually gone to university in the same year and studied the same subject. So we had both read French at university, different universities. And then something happened in the first year. Her father died and she went off the rails. She didn't have uh, a particularly great relationship with the, best, uh, with the rest of her family. 
she started uh, dabbling in uh, soft drugs and that led to harder drugs. And the upshot was that three years later, here we were, I had completed my degree and graduated and become a police officer. And she had dropped out of university and spiraled into drug use and crime. And it really had a profound effect on me because it, it made me realize how, how fine that line is and how easily someone's life tips into crisis. So it affected everything about how I policed, everything about how I spoke to people and everything now about how I write. Because that area, that line that, that she crossed over when her life started going wrong, that's the crisis point that I tend to write about in my novels. You can't really get more of an unreliable narrator than uh, someone who's trying to lie about a crime they committed or perhaps a victim who's presenting themselves as innocent but actually has a bit of a, a story they should be telling underneath. Um, I touched a little bit on liars when I talked about psychology. Um, we're not always lying when we're unreliable. Sometimes we're unreliable because we can't quite remember what's happened. Imagine if I was here in the room physically with you and a crime was committed, someone was murdered here in this room and we are all witnesses. We would all give our account to the police about what we saw, but we would all give a slightly different account. And that's not because we're lying. Hopefully, I'm sure you're all, uh, I can't see you, but I'm sure you look like very fine, upstanding citizens. So even though we think we're being true to ourselves, we've all got a slightly different perception of what happened. We all have our inbuilt prejudices and bias and learned experience that impacts on how we see the world. And, you know, you've only got to think about um, friends who, who perhaps say, no, that, that dress was blue, and you're saying, no, it's not, it's green. You know, we have a different way of looking at the world. So uh, unreliable narrators in real life in the police has enabled me to write, uh, to use unreliable narrators to great effect in my crime writing. Finding the story, this is an interesting one because being a police officer is about being a storyteller. And in order to tell the story, you have to find it first. And what I mean by that is not just the obvious stories that the victims and the witnesses and the suspects tell you, but the story that the fingerprints are telling, the story that the DNA is telling, the CCTV camera that shows a bit of another story that connects with the rest of the story until you've got the complete narrative. It's the story of all the different parts that you as a detective will weave together to put into a, a, a compelling story. I touched on empathy earlier. This is one of the most important things about being a writer. Um, and uh, I think a lot of the empathy that I have as a writer, I learned in the police. And finally, the bit that every police officer hates, and I loved, I loved doing my paperwork. I loved writing up my statements and making sure they summed up exactly what had happened. And once I'd found all the stories, I'd spoken to all the victims and the witnesses, and I had interviewed all those unreliable narrators, and I'd found the story that the cameras and the CCTV and the forensics had to tell me, then I would put everything together and write a summary of the entire case. And I would do that in a way that was compelling, that was exciting, that was true. I wasn't writing fiction, of course, but a story that was so compelling that a judge and jury or a magistrate's court would understand not just what had happened and who was responsible, but why it had happened and what impact it had had on everyone involved in the case. Wow, that's so really... I think Patricia now is going to yes. take over. Thank you so much, Claire. That was very interesting to know about the relationship between your writing and the 
previous career that you had as a police, how that uh, actually inspires and brings you different experience. Well, we'll take a little short break here as Clara can, you know, collect her breath and maybe have a little bit of water. And we have a little game with our audience here joining us on site. And also for those of us, those of us joining online, you can also join by telling us your response to this question by typing your answer to the comment box. So we would like to um, ask you, what excites you the most when reading a crime fiction? Okay, our on-site audience here are responding to this question right now. And let's take a look at the polling results right away. Well, option A is getting into the mindset of detectives. Option B is understanding criminal minds. Option C is knowing whether or not criminals will get away with it. And option D is seeing criminals punished at the end of the book. Okay, for now, most of our members in the audience picked option B, understanding criminal minds. Hmm, I hope that's not because you want to become a criminal, but <laughs> that's interesting to know. And okay. Claire, are you surprised to see that understanding criminal minds being the option that are, well, it's still moving. The polling quest, the, the polling results are still moving. Well, more of you picked getting into the mindset of detectives. Okay, both sides, the criminals and also the detectives. Uh, very interesting. Claire, are you surprised by the results? No, I'm not surprised <laughs> at all. I, I think this comes back to what I was saying about empathy is actually books, whether we're reading them or writing them, books enable us to step into someone else's shoes mm. and to help us understand them. And for some of us, we're fascinated by understanding uh, law enforcers and good people. Others are really intrigued by why people do bad things. Right, right. I'm sure you already know how our readers will be attracted to these like thrillers and criminal fictions. Now I will stand between you and your next part of the sharing and over to you again, Claire. Thank you. So if I was loving my police career so much, and I really was, why did I leave? Why did I hang up my hat? So um, I... I had a great career. I really did. I'd, uh, I'd been promoted numerous times and um, I was then working as a riot commander. So my job was to deal with um, big public events, demonstrations, protests, football matches, riots, those sorts of things to make decisions in advance about how many resources we needed and how we were going to make this event happen safely. And then on the day to make really fast decisions about how we were going to deal with things that were going wrong. And I really loved it, but it was really, really busy and life was really hard. Um, I had three very young children. So my children were all born within 15 months. Um, uh, my eldest and then a set of twins. And uh, at the time I'm going to talk about now, this moment where I decided to leave the police, they were perhaps four, three and three. So they were really small and demanding. Um, and my job got busier and busier. I was on a, a fast track program that was going to see me getting promoted again and again and my goal was to be a, a senior um, police officer sort of working at a political level to to make big changes in the in the policing landscape in the UK so I was really ambitious and really driven so what happened I had to do a, um, a kind of an assessment as part of my preparation for promotion to the next rank. It's called a 360 degree feedback process. And some of you in the room, <clears throat> some of you in the room might have done something like this at work. But basically what it involves is all your colleagues or a selection, a selection of colleagues from different levels. So people that are in your team that you supervise, people at the same level as you and people above you, your bosses, fill out a very long assessment form, a feedback form about what you're like, what you're like as a person, what you're like as a, a boss, a colleague, a, a team member, really, really brutally honest questions. And then what you get as a result is a summary of how you are viewed 
by other people that you work with. So as you can imagine, it's an incredibly useful tool for self-development at work, but it's also a pretty brutal process to go through. It's sort of, it's like one of those dreams where you think you're walking naked through, you know, through a busy high street. It's very exposing. Um, anyway, I did this questionnaire and I got my, my report, my results. And it was really good, like really, really good. Of course, there were developmental points, but this report told me that I was a really good person to work for, that I was a good boss, that I listened, that my door was always open. It told me that I was a really creative um, team member who always had ideas, who was always positive, had a, a can-do attitude. It was full of really great stuff. And so I took it home and I showed my husband because I was really proud. And I, you know, I looked at this report about how I always made time for everyone. And I was really supportive and positive and smiling all the time. And, and I showed it to my husband and he read it and he said, yeah, this is great. Who is this woman, though? Because I don't recognize her. Um, and it was a big, big defining moment in in my life, not just my career, because what it made me realize was that I was doing what I think a lot of people do, particularly women, which is I was using all the best bits of me for my job and giving my colleagues all the best bits, all the positivity, all the energy. And then I was coming home tired, exhausted, grumpy, not available all the time, not beaming all the time and and buzzing with creative ideas and can do attitudes I was a very different person at home and it made me think do is this how I want to live my life is is this you know do I want to be this awful person at home and this great positive person at work and and I didn't that was absolutely not the way I wanted to live my life and we had actually uh, we'd had a very difficult time having our, our family and one of our sons had died when he was a baby and so here I was with these three wonderful living children that I never saw because I was always at work and I firmly believe that women can absolutely have a fulfilling big busy career and be a fantastic mother I wasn't doing those things. I didn't have that balance at that particular moment. So I left. I took a career break and then I really had to think fast. So the only thing I knew how to do that I could do from home was to write. And I had to earn. I was, you know, I'd left a, a really busy, good career that was relatively well paid. And now I was at home and I needed to pay some bills. Um, so I started, I started writing. I wrote to, uh, I, I pitched to magazines and newspapers. I used all those skills that I'd learned in the police force about finding the right words and telling a, a compelling story. And I wrote articles and uh, I wrote copy for businesses and I wrote social media content. I wrote absolutely anything that people would pay me for. And somehow I made a living. Now, during this period, I'd also been writing uh, fiction. Um, I'd started writing a blog, first of all. So I wrote, I wrote a parenting blog which had a, a, a pretty good audience. It was back in the days where there weren't quite so many blogs. Nowadays, everyone has blogs or is writing online. It's much harder to get an audience. But then I was one of perhaps 200 parent bloggers in the UK and we all knew each other. And I, uh, I started writing and it was a really good learning process because suddenly I was writing for an audience and I didn't always know who that audience was who was reading my blog but one day I got um, a, a message from somebody in Australia and I'd written a blog post about postnatal depression and how I'd struggled after I'd had my children and she wrote to me and said 
I've been struggling for weeks and weeks and I haven't been able to tell my doctor or my husband how I feel because I can't find the words. And today I've read your blog post and it so perfectly sums up what I'm going through that I've just printed it out and given it to my doctor. And now I think I, I'll be able to get help. And it was an incredibly powerful email to receive. And it made me realize, I think, the the power of words as a writer. So in all my years as a reader, I'd always understood the power that a book had to move me and to connect with me. But I hadn't quite made that leap that perhaps I had the ability to write in such a way that I could connect with other people. So I started to write for other people. I started to write fiction that I wanted to be published. And the first book that I wrote, um, which might come as some surprise given my background in law enforcement and my current job as a crime writer, the first book I wrote was a romantic comedy. And I did get some agent um, interest, in fact, worked with an agent for quite a long time. Um, and she gave me some really good advice. And then we had an offer, a tentative offer from a publisher and the agent I was working with, because I was terribly excited, the agent I was working with said, I don't think we should pursue this. I don't think you should have this book, this romantic comedy published. And I said, that doesn't make sense. You know, I'm desperate to have this book published. Here's a publisher who I think wants to publish it. You know, I could have a book on the shelves in, in a year's time. This is terribly exciting. And the agent said, you need to think very, very carefully about this new career of yours because this debut novel of yours will always be your debut novel. Doesn't matter what you do in the future, doesn't matter how, you know, what brilliant books you write, this will be your first novel. This is your first impression. This is the book that will define your career. Is this the book you want to define you? And it wasn't, and it wasn't because it was my first novel and actually I'll let you into a little secret first novels are often not brilliant because we tend to put a lot of our own story into our first novels and we're learning how to structure a story so you'd be surprised how many authors I know have first novels tucked away at home that will never see the light of day but also because I was starting to think that actually I wanted to write something a little bit darker, a little bit grittier, perhaps a little bit more substantial than this rather frothy, funny book that I'd written, first of all. So I took the, author, uh, took the agent's advice and I didn't um, pursue that. Uh, and I ditched that book, that romantic comedy, which I think is probably still on my computer somewhere. So what was I gonna do next? I, I was um, successfully at home um, working as a, um, a kind of a jobbing writer doing copy and journalism. Um, and the agent said, well, what do you want to write next? And I had this idea for a thriller. Um, so that is what I wrote next. So my first novel was called, I Let You Go. And I didn't know whether anyone would like it. I had this idea when I started writing it for this enormous twist, this thing that I wanted to do to a reader. And I didn't know if it was possible to make a reader think this particular thing only to change it, but I wanted to give it a go. Um, and I Let You Go is the book that changed everything for me because just before I was due to go back to the police. After my two year career break, I signed a two book deal and I handed in my warrant card for good and never went back to the police. And I was then a fully fledged full-time writer. I Let You Go went on to sell a million copies and uh, be translated into 40 languages. Um, and it really did change my life. Now, when you've had a book that has sold so well around the world, it's, it's quite hard to write another one. And I really struggled with my second book. And actually, I See You, which you see on screen now, uh, isn't my second book. 
I wrote another book in between I Let You Go and I See You. And the bottom line was it just wasn't good enough. I was really struggling with the pressure of the success of I Let You Go, all these countries, all the travel I was doing. I was going all around the world, meeting readers, signing books. And I felt absolutely panicked and really couldn't write properly at all. So I wrote the second novel and I said to my editor, I'm really worried about it. I don't think it's as good as I Let You Go. And I was sort of hoping, I suppose, that she would say, oh, no, 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 it's great. You know, like if you maybe go shopping with a friend and you try something on and, and you sort of say, do, you know, does this make me look all right? It's quite nice when someone goes, yeah, yeah, it's, it's great. It's brilliant. Anyway, my editor did not say that. My editor said, no, I don't think it's um, I don't think this is good either, which was a big problem. And then that left me with two choices, either to carry on working on it to try and make it better or to throw it away and start again. And so I threw it away and I wrote something different. And I See You was always going to be my third book. So I bumped it up, I promoted it to book two. And fortunately it became another Sunday Times bestseller with lots of foreign rights all around the world. Now the pressure of, people often talk about the difficult second book, like the difficult second album. Um, and all I can say is there's a difficult second book, there's a difficult third book, it just keeps going. So when it came to write my third novel, guess what? I really struggled. Um, even though I'd done it twice, I still really, I still really worried. I worried about that book that I'd thrown away. You know, what if I, what if I, it happens again? What if I do the wrong thing? So I, I had to throw away half a book between I See You and Let Me Lie, um, which, you know, at least I only wrote half of it before I realised that actually it wasn't really working. So again, I spoke to my editor and this time I was the one who, who said this, this is no good, I'm going to have to stop. So the book that I thought was going to be book four then became book three. And Let Me Lie um, is uh, another psychological um, thriller, which actually is based on a real life case. But I can't tell you what that case is because the, the plot twist in the book is, uh, is the real life plot twist. And so if I were to tell you what case it was based on, it would spoil the book. And I, I hate spoiling books for anyone. Um, but Let Me Lie is about uh, a woman called Anna whose parents both took their own lives a year pre a year apart from each other in identical situations, so a kind of you know copycat suicide. And um, Anna, their daughter, has never believed that they died by suicide, and so she has she's on a mission to prove that they were murdered. Um, and like most of my books, it has a really big twist in it. So talking of twists bit of a plot twist. You can probably see from these covers that After the End, which was my first, my fourth novel, is a slightly different book to the others. Um, and, you know, we, we talk about not judging a book by their covers, but it's important actually, isn't it, to have some kind of signaling for what type of book we're about to pick up. After the End is what I might call a family drama. So it has the same sorts of emotional intensity and um, twists and turns and the same sort of domestic drama that my earlier novels have, but there are no crimes committed. It's about, uh, it's about two parents who disagree over the um, medical treatment that their critically ill son should receive. And this is a book that isn't inspired by my police career or by any story that I read, but by something that happened to me and my family. So when my son was very, very ill, we were asked to make a decision whether we wanted to continue to um, have him treated and to fight for new ways of trying to, uh, trying to keep him alive, accepting the significant, profound disabilities that he would 
he would go on to have um, that meant he would be blind and deaf and have no or very little awareness of the world around him? Or did we want to remove him from intensive care and allow him to pass away? And the consultant asked us to make this decision as his parents. And I said to the doctor, what happens if we don't agree? Because, you know, lots of couples disagree on all sorts of things and it, it doesn't always matter, but this mattered. And the consultant said, you have to agree because the alternative is unthinkable. And that's what I wanted to write years later is the unthinkable two parents who love each other so much, but they love their son more and they want different things for him. And I was worried about this slight pivot into a different genre, but all of my crime readers came with me to this new book and um, then came back to the crime genre with me, uh, with book five. Now the cover that you will have seen in the lovely holding screen that was up here at the start of the event is a little bit different. So it's got two houses on it, it's quite dark and gray, and we see the, the clouds above the houses and the plane going through the sky. And that is the cover of the hardback, it's the cover in lots of other countries around the world. But the cover that you see on screen now is the UK paperback cover. And I've included it here because it's one of my favorites. Um, I, uh, yeah, really love the design, love the way it kind of pops on, on the screen. So Hostage is about a, uh, a flight, as you might have guessed, from London to, as we heard earlier, Sydney. It's a locked room thriller. It takes place on a 20 hour nonstop flight and it revolves around a conundrum, uh, a dilemma that a flight attendant is presented with. She is asked to facilitate the hostage of the plane, the hijack of the plane. And if she doesn't comply, then her child, her family at home, are in danger. So she has to make a decision. Does she protect her family or does she do her job and save her own life and the lives of everyone on the plane? What does she do? What would you do? Uh, you'll have to read the book and let me know what you think. And finally, another kind of pivot, I suppose, another little change of direction, uh, still in the crime genre, but the last party is my upcoming book, and it's the first in a series. And I wanted to talk a little bit about crime series. And I'd love to know in the comments um, where, and in your questions, whether you like to read books that are standalone, you've, you know, you're not gonna see these characters again, or series books where the characters go on from one book to another. And I'd love to know what it is you, what it is you love about each type of book. So the last party takes place in a fictional part of the world near North Wales in the UK, which is where I live. It takes place on a border between England and Wales. And the border between England and Wales runs right through the middle of a lake. Now lakes are something I'm really quite fixated on. I live near a very beautiful lake that I can walk to from my garden and I like to swim there. And I organized the New Year's Day swim in our town. And when I started doing this, there were maybe six, eight of us. And now there are over a hundred people who come on New Year's Day and plunge into one degree water um, and shout Happy New Year and set ourselves up for the new year. Uh, so a few years ago, I was at the New Year's Day swim. And if you can imagine this beautiful, beautiful lake with, with water like glass, absolutely flat, and a mountain looking over the, the lake, and the mist is sort of lying low on the water. And we all plunged into the lake and everyone shouting. And I wasn't thinking, oh, what an amazing moment, happy new year, isn't this beautiful? What I was thinking was, what if a body floated through the water right now, what would happen? 
this is obviously a, a, a fairly warped way of living your life, but this is what happens when you're a crime writer, is you're constantly thinking of how you might kill a fictional character. So I started working on this concept and I thought, well, what would happen as well if the body started in one country and ended in another? If the person was killed in England, but the body was found in Wales, that would prompt a cross-border investigation. And what would that be like? Because culturally, there are challenges in the relationships between these, these two countries. There are, <clears throat> there are different languages spoken. There are different expectations. And I wanted to put two people working together who ostensibly spoke the same language. They both speak English. Um, but only Fionn, who's my female detective, speaks Welsh. And how will they work together? So I put these two characters together and Detective Constable Fionn Morgan, who is um, a very fierce, spiky, wonderful female detective, um, walked onto my page and I thought, this is not a standalone book. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is a character that I want to come back to. And I think this is the start of a series. Unfortunately, my editor agreed. And so the last party, the first in the DC Fionn Morgan series will come out in a couple of weeks. And yesterday we just announced that the television rights have been sold. So all very exciting times. So that, my voice is going, so it's just as well we're coming towards the end. Um, before I wrap up and we move to questions, Patricia, give us another quiz. Yes, here I am, Claire. Well, thank you so much for the sharing. And I can't wait to get a copy of your upcoming book already because it sounds really, really, really exciting. And well, um, one thing I want to share as well, Claire, thank you so much for sharing your inspiring journey. I could relate so much, especially as a female go-getter, you know, how you can balance out your work and your family and really putting a passion into to what you're doing it's uh, very precious thank you so much for sharing so i see our on-site audience already grabbed their phone and scanned the qr code and already started with the polling so the question here we have is what aspect of crime fiction provides you with the most suspense option a is murders option b missing persons option c mysterious happenings and option d hostages well so far most of our members in the audience picked Option C, mysterious happenings, followed by option A, murder. Okay, and the polling results keep changing and they're taking the time to respond to the questions. For those of you joining us online, you can also type your answer in the comment box so that we know your preference. And Claire, you can definitely, you know, refer to this to think about what to feature in your next book. All right, so most of you picked option C, obviously. So yeah, Claire, that's a very interesting result for us. And thank you everyone for sharing a little bit about yourself with us today as well. All right, so Claire, I hope you've taken the little time for a short break and had your water. And I will not stand between you and the rest of your sharing and I will hand the floor back to Claire right away. Thank you. So I'm just, just going to kind of wrap up really, because what I'm really keen to do <clears throat> is answer your questions. So please do put your questions um, to us because I'd love to answer anything about my books, my career or my writing process. So a lot of people ask me now whether I miss the police and the answer changes from uh, from day to day. I miss making a difference. I miss uh, making um, uh, meeting people from all over the world. Um, uh, but do I miss actually being a police officer? Not really. I think I, I feel very lucky that I'm able to uh, make up things for a living, that I can work from home, uh, that I get to travel and meet readers and do events, even when they're virtual. So I think if I had to choose, I would definitely stick and not twist. Um, 
I one of the things I love doing is chatting to my readers online. And so if you're not already following me, I would absolutely love you to come and say hello. I'm pretty easy to search for um, on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, and more recently on TikTok, which is horrifying my children, but I'm having a lot of fun there. So come and find me on any of those platforms and let me know what you're reading. I'd love your recommendations on books. Thank you so much for listening today. And let's see if we've got any questions. Yes, Claire, we already have several questions here with us. And um, I'm going to read out the questions so that you can answer for us. And before that, remember to follow Claire. And if you want to, you know, ask your questions later on in private, you can do that as well. So Claire, we have three questions for you here. The first one, Oh, she starts with, I like series book. Why did you think of writing a crime series for the last party? Do you want to write about more complicated crimes? That's the first question for you, Claire. Oh, that's interesting. Do I want to write about more complicated crimes? I think so. So I always said that I would never write a crime series just for the sake of it, even though I know that crime series are really popular. But I always felt that you have to have the right character and the right setting. And in none of my other books have I really sort of felt this is a world that I want to return to or that I think readers will will miss. And, and really what you're looking for is, is someone and some place where when that book finishes and the reader turns the final page, they feel a a sort of sense of loss that they want to know what's going on with those characters. Um, and the other reason is that actually it really does have to be someone like a police officer or uh, perhaps a journalist or someone who is an investigator. They're the ones that have got to carry a story. And a lot of my books, although I have an investigation in them, really the central character is normally an ordinary person. And you can't very easily make those sorts of books into series because imagine putting the same ordinary person through a series of horrific, traumatic events and crimes. It, it just, it would be very unfair and a little unbelievable. So part of it, as I said, when I talked about The Last Party was about the world that I'd created, this, this cross-border investigation I thought was intriguing. Fionn, I felt, was a, a character that people would really love and, and want to know more about. The complicated crimes is an interesting one. And although I hadn't really thought of it like that, I think you might have a point. I think that crime series do enable us to really focus on the mystery and um, the mystery that I've created for the last party is a really complicated one to guess. So, you know, you might, if you're really, really good, if you're a really good armchair detective, maybe you'll figure out how this person was murdered and who by, but it is not straightforward. Um, I had a, a, an, an amazing piece of, a feedback, a comment from Patricia Cornwell, who is one of my all-time literary heroes, who uh, who read The Last Party and said it had echoes of Agatha Christie. And I don't think there's a better compliment than that. So hopefully you'll enjoy the mystery in it. What's our next question, Patricia? Okay, we can't wait to read the book as well. Okay, the next question is, have you ever put lines, I guess, statement from victims in the real world into your novel? Absolutely not, no. And that, actually, this is something I feel quite strongly about. And when I was talking earlier about inspiration and taking inspiration from real life cases, I, I feel that we need to be very careful about using real life trauma as entertainment. So in, in my case, I Let You Go was, um, was inspired by a hit and run that happened in the town where I was, in the city I was working in, but it's not based on that. So it has nothing to do with the real life case. The, the, the setup is completely different. The reason for the hit and run and the investigation, everything is different. All that case did was it made me think, how can someone drive away from the scene of a hit and run that's killed a child? What does that do to the driver 
years later, are they struggling with guilt? What does it do to the mother of the child who let go of that child's hand? How do they process that trauma? So what I tend to do is I will take inspiration from something real and perhaps inspiration from a person that I've met and maybe combine a character trait or something one person has made me think with another person but I would never just lift real life and put it in fiction because I think people deserve more respect and more privacy than to be used for our entertainment. Right and that's very important as well. Um, okay we have the next question for you that is have you ever thought of venturing into the film industry? writing for films or converting your stories into films or TV shows. I think there is an upcoming one already. Is that correct, Claire? Uh, yeah, so uh, as I said, we've just we've just sold the um, uh, TV option for the last party. So that is in, um, in development at the moment, which is really exciting. Uh, TV and film takes a really long time. So just to give you an example, we sold the TV rights to I Let You Go in 2014. And we have been in development ever since. So I've written scripts and we have cast it and we have found directors and um, budgets and all sorts. And it still hasn't got off the ground because TV is expensive and complicated and people change their mind and it's it's a really tricky and frustrating one. So I try not to think too much about it and just concentrate on writing books. But I did enjoy the screenwriting experience. It's, it's very, very different. It's faster, which is quite nice. You have to think much more about um, obviously what sort of the visual aspect of course because it's it's screen and so in a book we might have pages and pages of internal thought and the only reason we know what that character is thinking is because we we are inside their head with them so how do you portray that and you know on screen do you have the this sort of shown on the actor's face or is it a piece of dialogue with somebody or you know an action that they're doing so it's a completely different way of presenting something but I found as well that it kind of tightened up my novel writing as well which was interesting so since I did some screenwriting it made my dialogue sharper it made my scenes sort of snappier I would come in a bit later and I'd leave a bit earlier and I wouldn't sort of have wouldn't waste space having people just wandering around not adding to the the action so um uh, yeah, is, is the, the short answer is yes, I would love to do more of that. And I'm excited to see The Last Party adapted for screen. Yeah, it's, it's like taking the power of words to the next level. All right. All right, we'll have another question. Oh, we actually have two more. Uh, this one says, what is the biggest difference between life as a police officer and a writer? Well... There are lots of differences. I mean, I get to work in my pyjamas, which would definitely have been <laughs> frowned upon when I was a police officer. And of course, you know, the really big difference is I, I tell lies. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I tell stories that aren't true. And that is absolutely not something that I, I could have done or would have done as a police officer. But I suppose the biggest difference is that I am my own boss now and the interesting thing is that if I were to do another one of those 360 degree feedback um, questionnaires and if I were to really analyze how my work-life balance is and how much time I take off and how much time I spend with my head full of stories and work and preparing presentations like these and traveling, I suspect that I am probably working just as hard, if not harder now, as I did in the police and that I am guilty of perhaps losing that work-life balance a little bit and not being you know entirely present for my family as much as I should so um, I'm my own boss 
but actually I am probably the worst boss I've ever had um, and don't give myself enough time off. So I'm working on that. Yeah, but our re- your readers will be very happy because you're going to bring us a lot of great stories. Okay, one last question for you, Claire. Um, do you have any recommendations to young writers? Oh, that's a lovely question. Uh, yes, the the... The sort of overriding recommendation is to read, 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 and don't stick to your own genre. So even if what you love writing is science fiction, read romance, read crime, read literary fiction, read manga, read everything you possibly can, because they'll all teach you something about how to tell a story. It's often it's also quite a, 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 um, a good way of learning about how to tell stories is to watch films. And I know that's a really odd thing for a writer to recommend you do. But if you re- if you watch a film and you really pinpoint how that story is told, you know, wh- where the obstacles are between the hero getting their you know their goal whether it's solving a crime or finding the woman or whatever it is what are those obstacles how do they overcome them when do they hit crisis points because all those sort of main beats are what you'll need in in your novel and it's much easier to see that sometimes on screen and then my third tip is just to finish the book so a lot of people I, I speak to and not just young writers but writers of all ages say oh, I've been writing a book for you know years and uh, I, I just you know I keep going back and changing things and I'm just never going to finish finish the draft stop going back stop making chapter three absolutely perfect before you move on to chapter four keep going chapter four chapter five chapter six keep going until you've finished because you can't edit a blank page Right, keep going and start first. And that is a very wonderful advice. Thank you so much, Claire, for answering all the questions. We actually have more questions, but due to time limit, uh, sadly, I know we have to end our session here right now. And at this juncture, we would like to, on behalf of Book Depository, the Hong Kong Book Fair, and of course myself, I'd like to thank Claire McIntosh once again for joining us today, as well as our participants here, both at the fair and online at home. Ladies and gentlemen here, joining physically at in Hong Kong, could you please give a big round of applause to thank our author again. Thank you so much, Claire. Thank you so much for having me and I hope that next time I shall be there in person. 